Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. For over 30 years, the work of the Draft Heroes Program has been to move people to stick their necks out for the common good and to give them tools to succeed. We say that we're encouraging today's heroes and training tomorrow's. In the beginning, I was finding people who were doing courageous, compassionate things, interviewing them with a portable tape recorder, writing scripts, getting actors to record the scripts, editing the sound tapes, putting the finished stories in, onto 33 RPM recordings. If you're young, you don't even know what that is, do you? And snail mailing the records to radio stations. It seems quaint now, of course. Mind you, nobody hired me to do this, and nobody was paying me. Instead of flying off to France to write a speech for the Aga Khan, I was chasing down philanthropists, asking them just to pay the costs of the recording and the mailings. Everyone who knew me, including my family, thought I was nuts. But I had to do it. I could see that citizens were becoming consumers in the United States. Our political leaders actually spoke constantly about the well-being of consumers, not the rights and duties of citizens. Our news media were so focused on the overwhelming nature of the problems in the world that they were poisoning the body politic, producing hopelessness and helplessness, and a nation of people willing to accept the tiny societal role of consuming rather than participating and contributing as active citizens. Something had to be done. Well, I knew a lot of people in media, and I knew how to write. So I put my skill and contacts to work in an attempt to fix the problem. I felt compelled, and I just kept going. Now, here we are, three decades later, and it's all online. Not just material for media, but also for schools, and for families, and for anyone else who needs an antidote to the poisonous idea that we can do nothing but buy stuff. I invite you to hashtag Giraffe Heroes, hashtag stick your neck out, to Giraffe Heroes on Google+, to Giraffe Heroes Facebook, but most of all, to our online home base, giraffe.org. You can go on the nav bar of the website to a thing called Find a Hero. You can type in a geographical area that interests you, add a problem that concerns you, an age group, a gender, maybe adult women working on environmental issues in Africa. You hit search and you'll get stories. If you were looking for very young heroes, you might get Kenesha Johnson. This is an American girl who found out that, or saw that the immigrant kids in her school in Los Angeles were being harassed. The American kids were telling them they talked funny, they wouldn't involve them in games, they, wouldn't, they didn't want to talk to them in class. And this little fifth grader girl said, that's not right. So she started championing the in immigrant kids, uh, stuck up for them on the playground, got them involved in games, tutored them on language and homework, and got them really involved in their, their class. If there are teachers among you, um, there is a free full year curriculum on how to train a young giraffe online, free to the taking. It's called It's Up to Us, and you can find it on the website. Let's see. For the little, little people in your families, we have stories online about how the giraffe got its long neck, of course, by being compassionate and brave. And the stories are told by these two characters we invented, called, they're twins, they're not a couple, because that gets you into giggles with the kids. Um, they are twin giraffes named Stanley Tall and Beatrice Tall, as in Stan Tall and Be Tall. 
Their stories work even for pre-readers because we got actors to record the stories and uh, a composer and musicians to create a soundtrack so even little kids can take in the stories. And I have to credit this man who was my inspiration. I have a huge debt to him. He, this is Joseph Campbell, the great scholar and teacher who gave his life to understanding the profound stories that people tell each other all over the world. His book, a Hero, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, is the ultimate study of the world's heroes. I knew him, I took his classes, and can never forget his closing a three-day seminar on heroes with this image of the holy fool. Joe said, look at him. He hasn't got a thing to his name. He's kind of a hobo. The dog, nip, dog nipping at the fool's heels represents the world's criticism of what he's doing and where he's going, but he doesn't care. He's headed for danger. That's a cliff ahead of him. He's not listening. He's got to do what he's got to do. He's got a purpose, and he's not stopping. I told Joe after he did that seminar that I realized I've been finding the holy fools of our time. I just call them giraffe heroes. The people who see something that must be done to serve life and just do it. He teared up and I promised myself I wouldn't quit finding these people and telling their stories as long as the world needs real heroes, our own holy fools. Here are just a few of the hundreds of oh-so-real heroes you can find at giraffe.org. This is Marie Willingham. She was hired to tutor students who needed help at the University of North Carolina. Now, this is a, a university that is very, very successful in football and basketball. And she discovered that the students she was tutoring were mostly athletes who had gotten uh, scholarships because they were very good basketball or football players. What she also discovered was that some of them couldn't read. And they were not going to class, and they were not being tested, they were not being taught at all. They just played ball. One of her students asked her if she would please teach him to read well enough that he could read the newspaper reports about his games. She was appalled. And she told the university that this was shocking. They needed to educate these young men that, that they were cheating them out of their futures by just exploiting them to play ball. She got fired. Uh, the university did not like hearing that, but she took the case to court. She won the point that the uh, university was actually cheating these young students, and they are now getting an education. This is Randy Thompson. He, uh, I don't know if you've heard the stories, but we have this little issue in the States of a pipeline coming down from Canada to the Gulf of Mexico and uh, lots of opposition, opposition to it. There's even a First Nations uh, move to declare war because the pipeline is crossing their land in Canada. So it's a big, big controversy. And this fellow is a, is a farmer in Nebraska, and he was asked if the pipeline could come across his land, and he thought, well, I'll think about it. And then he looked into it and saw all of the times that these pipelines have leaked destroying land and water supplies. And when they came back to his farm again to talk to him, he just said, not only no, but hell no. You are not going to spoil my land. I inherited this from three generations, and I will protect it. Uh, they offered him so much money, you would just be amazed. Uh, and then they tried eminent domain to just take the land away from him. He's not only fighting back, he's gotten farmers all along the pipeline to look at their responsibility to steward their land and to fight against having it spoiled. Hazel Wolf lived in three centuries. She was born in 1899 and died in 2001, very determined to make it into the third century. She started uh, 
sticking her neck out when she was, I guess, oh, 13, in 1912. She noticed that at her school in Canada, boys had sports teams, but girls didn't. And she said, that's not fair. So she went to the principal and she said, how about basketball? And he said, girls don't want to play basketball. She said, yes, we do. He said, you prove it. You get me enough girls to you know, create a, a team, and I'll, yeah, I'll give you court time, and I'll get you a ball. And she opened the principal's office door, and she had 10 girls waiting in the hall. And they all said, yeah, we want to play ball. So they won. She spent the rest of her life advocating for causes. And when we met her, she was 85, and she was going all over the Pacific Northwest enlisting First Nations uh, people on the reservations to work with the, uh, the urban environmental activists to protect the environment of the Northwest. They had never talked to each other before. And this 85-year-old little old lady just bopped around and got them all to work together. Uh, if you've been on any airplanes lately, you know uh, there are usually air marshals on flights to make sure no terrorists can take over the plane. This guy was an air marshal in the States, and uh, he, just, he just kept resisting stupid orders. You know, everybody looks so informal and, and relaxed on planes these days. It's not like when I started flying when you had to dress up. Um, everybody looks like they're going to the beach, I don't know. And he, he, they got an order for all air marshals that had to wear a suit and tie on the plane. And he said, everybody will know who we are. <laughs> it's supposed to be a secret, which guy is the air marshal? So he refused to do that. He got in a lot of trouble on that one. And then the, the agency issued an order saying, um, we're not going to put any uh, air marshals on long flights because we'd have to pay your hotel room at the other end. It was a budget cut. And he's saying, do you understand that th this, will be under, this will be known, that if you want to hijack a plane, pick one that's going really far, because there won't be an air marshal on it. So he fought that one, and he got fired. But he uh, fought the case in the courts, went up, 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 up. Last week, he won in the US Supreme Court in Washington, DC. They said, that's the stupidest thing we ever heard put the air marshals on the plane, give this guy his job back, and forget the suits and ties. This is Dora Andrade. She was a dancer, still is, in Rio de Janeiro. When she was looking at what she might do about the problems of the income disparity there, where the favelas are just really, really extremely, extremely poor, uh, she decided that she would use what she knows how to do. She would teach dancing in the favela. And then she discovered that the girls who came to her classes were not strong enough to dance because they didn't have enough food. So she started a nutrition program for them. Then she found out they were flunking in school because they didn't have a, a good enough school system. She's put in tutors. She has such a wonderful school in this ballet dancing school that for all for poor kids, that wealthy families in Rio de Janeiro are pretending to be poor to try to get their kids into her school. So she saw something she had that she could use uh, for the purpose of alleviating this poverty disparity. This is Musharraf Al Hussein. He's an imam in Nottingham, England. And there's a big problem all over uh, Europe and, and in England of young men being recruited by the fundamentalist terrorists to go and be trained and to cause as much damage as possible when they get back to their home countries. Musharraf stood up against that and said, no, we are, we are British. We are members of this community and we are not going to do this. And he set up all kinds of programs to work with young men to keep them involved in being part of their country rather than going off and coming back as terrorists. He's taken considerable flack for this, as you might imagine. This is Wangari Matai. 
She was a um, professor at a university in Nairobi, a, a botany, so she knew a lot about plants and trees. She was looking at the income problems and the disparity of income in her country and decided that what she would do was teach the women of Kenya to plant and nurture fruit trees. The, she got so many women organized that the, the, the whole shade the shade came back to places that had been bulldozed for uh, development. She got them seeing what they could do, uh, the, being able to make a change in their world. And the women went on to do all kinds of things that sort of distressed a lot of people. Um, she, got, she kept getting arrested because the government at that time did not like the idea of organizing the poor. But she kept going, no matter how many times they put her in jail. And we found her about 20 years before the Nobel Peace Prize found her. I'm very proud of that. This is Thierry Vrain. He's a Canadian botanist, another botanist, who was working on developing new products for the Canadian uh, Department of Agriculture, whatever they call it. And uh, he invented a new apple, he invented a new pear. And then he started getting word that maybe the research that said genetically modified organisms were not as safe as he had been told. Uh, he, he was approached it very scientifically and said, if that research was tainted, we must stop until we have legitimate, verifiable, replicable uh, data that this is safe. He took an awful lot of flack from his peers uh, and, of course, from all the advocates of genetically modified or organisms. Chandini Pereira is a plastic surgeon in Sri Lanka. There are only six of them in the country, which means lots of economic opportunity there. You could do a lot of facelifts for rich, rich ladies. Uh, instead, she, her purpose was to uh, work with the women who had been burned in fires or with, with acid. And they have a serious problem of women being attacked by their families if they want to get rid of them. And the women are ostracized after their, if they don't die in the attacks. And some of them actually have tried to burn themselves. There's, it's suicide, or attempts at suicide. And she saw that they were, if they survived, they were uh, ostracized. They were not part of the community anymore. She not only set up a free clinic to work on the burns, she worked on rehabilitating their lives and helping them get back into a sustainable uh, way of living without families who try to kill them. This is Farai Maguwu. He is in Zimbabwe, and if you are wearing a diamond, it may have come from Zimbabwe. Uh, but what is not happening is good treatment of the miners at the diamond mines and having some of the money stay in Zimbabwe, it all leaves. It goes, you know, abroad. So Zimbabwe remains a very poor country for most people, even though they have this incredible mineral wealth. And Farai Maguwu is working to uh, champion the miners and the safety of their work conditions, and to work out deals where more of that money stays with the people of Zimbabwe. Tajwar Kakar is an Afghanistani teacher. Um, she made the mistake, according to the government, of teaching girls. Before that, she, uh, she was a, um, guerrilla fighter against the occupation when the Soviets held Afghanistan. So she got, she got arrested then, and then she got arrested for teaching girls. Um, she had to flee the country, and she walked out of Af Afghanistan with her six kids and a seventh one in her arms who was two months old. In the refugee camp, she was teaching girls. 
There were a lot of uh, fundamentalist elements in the refugee camp who did not believe in teaching girls, and they were threatening her again, so she fled with her family to Australia. They are all there safe now, and she is back in Afghanistan teaching girls. Olga Bloom was a musician with a big New York City symphony orchestra. And when she retired, she built with her bare hands, she, this, she built this uh, concert hall. That's a coffee barge that she salvaged out of a boatyard. She lined it with beautiful wood. She created a stage. She put in all the facilities she needed and got it towed under the Brooklyn Bridge. It is the only place in New York you can hear great music if you're not rich, because her ticket prices are very reasonable. And the musicians love it. They come from all over the world to play there. She, she worked on this from 65 to 92, living on her social security check the entire time. And I love this. When she was leaving her last day before she left to go to a retirement home at 92, she raised all the musicians' salaries. This is the oldest man to ever get a commendation. His name is Nicholas Winton, and he, we actually found him when he was 103, not 100, and he's still alive. Um, when he was a young man, he found out that the Germans in, were taking the Jews out of occupied territories in Europe and killing them. He got over a thousand kids onto trains and boats safe, to safety in England, and he never mentioned it. His own wife didn't know. So someone found out about it many, many years later and gathered up people who were now grown up, of course, that he had rescued and brought them all together. Oh, oh. <laughs> the youngest person to ever be commended is the little one there, she was six. This is Catherine and Isabel Adams. They heard that uh, kids were dying in Africa because they didn't have clean water to drink. And they figured they had a purpose then, boy. They, they wanted to do something about that. And they had to figure out, what have we got? What could we do? Um, they had one Japanese grandparent, and she had taught them to do ikibana. So they said, okay, we'll make these pretty things and we'll sell them and we'll give the money to these people who are building water wells in Africa. And uh, so they made a, a bunch of them for Christmas in Christmas colors and took them to a Starbucks. And they put a little sign up of what they were for and where the money was going. And they were gone in an hour. So they ran home and made more. They have now taught other kids to do this and together they have raised half a million dollars for clean water in Africa. Love this guy. Um, this is uh, Janos Varga, who heard that the Danube River was going to be dammed, and he organized the community to stop this idiotic idea, and then he led them in saving their groundwater and their drinking water. They are all as you might say, holy fools. Um, they're all doing something they have a purpose to do and they're not letting anybody stop them no matter what. And what do they get from us? A piece of paper. They get a commendation and we ask to tell their stories. We are now working on something nobody knows about except you will now. Um, We've always wanted to help them do their work and never had the resources to do it. So we're now working on an entirely new operation that will make it possible for see people seeing these stories to directly fund giraffe heroes whose work they love right from their smartphones. I haven't been as excited about a new venture in years and I really want to get the funding for these heroes. So wish us luck getting this to, to work. But in the decades that we've only sent the piece of paper, only told their stories, the messages that have come back have been stunning, like this one. Being named a giraffe has been the single most morally uplifting event for me and my family, 
a single beam of light in a forest of negatives. So many of them have been told that they're crazy, that they should shut up and sit down. Then we tell them they're not nuts, they're heroes. One of them told me that one piece of paper is gonna keep me going another 10 years. I see purpose in all their stories. I see people who have seen what their lives must be about. They've all figured out what they have to offer, large or small. I see people who have used their skills to pursue their purpose despite hardships and obstacles. And what I see in their stories is that life can be hard, so we must help each other. We must not opt out, must not run on self-interest. We're all in this boat together. Compassionate, courageous involvement is our ticket to ride. The price we pay for being here, surrounded by fellow beings who often need something large or small that we have to give. What is it? What skill or talent do you have? What are you concerned about? If you haven't already found your purpose, when should you start looking for it? Start sticking your neck out. As you can see, some people start very young. I was 50 when I figured out what, what, that my ability to write could be put to work for the purpose of giving people a spark of hope and models for action. Olga Bloom, was 65 when she started working on her music barge. So it's never too late. There's something each of us can do now, soon, or later. May you figure out what it is you can do, what you have to offer, sooner rather than later. May you pursue your purpose with zeal and with great success. May you lead meaningful, satisfying, significant lives. Thank you. One of the things you, that we wondered about, and for a while we, could, we knew all the giraffes in the beginning, there were only 10 or 20 and then 30 and 100. We wanted to know what made them tick. Maybe you do too. They do take risks. They don't always succeed. Uh, it's hard work. Uh, they're often, almost always, criticized by somebody, so why do they do it? Wise people from the beginning of time uh, have been telling us that there, there's no more important need, no more important ambition in any of us than that our lives be meaningful. You look in the mirror in the morning, don't we all want to see who looks back in that mirror as, as somebody that matters? Don't we all want to know that we're on this planet more, to do more than just take up space? Of course we do. And look to your own experiences. When, when you're doing something that's meaningful, something that's really on purpose for you, aren't you more excited? Aren't you more satisfied? Isn't there more energy and, and, and fun and satisfaction in what you're doing? And other people around you, when they see you doing something that's meaningful, isn't, aren't they more likely to be inspired and to follow your lead? You, call it a, you can call it a peak moment or call it whatever you want to, but when you're doing something that you're passionate about because it really fits with who you are deep inside, uh, is really meaningful to you, you act differently and you're perceived differently by other people because what you're doing is meaningful. So if we can uh, agree that meaning in our lives is that important as it is for these giraffes, next question might be, where does meaning come from? Where does it come from? And for that, I'm gonna tell you a backstory. After I graduated from college, I decided I would hitchhike around the world and did that, hitchhiking through places like Syria and Iran and, uh, and Iraq working as a stringer, a foreign correspondent for the Boston Globe in places like Laos and Cyprus and Vietnam. So I decided I would join the US Foreign Service and they didn't disappoint. Yeah, the career was great, the adventures were great, but, but something was missing. Somewhere buried deep in me was a sense that I really wanted to help end the suffering, not start it in the world. I wanted to do something to help the world deal with, with poverty and violence and, and all the rest of it. 
Then the State Department sent me up to New York City, to America's Embassy to the United Nations, where it so happened I was put in charge of America's policy toward Africa. Part of my purview at the United Nations was dealing with South Africa, which in those years was run by a white racist regime in a system of institutionalized racism, which those of you with a little gray hair will know is called apartheid. Um, it was a, a brutal system of oppression of black people by white people. I saw that one way to strike at the apartheid regime would be to remove the guns and the military equipment being used to oppress blacks. So on my own, and at an enormous risk to my career, I began developing a plan with other members of the Security Council to cut off the supply of guns and military equipment to the white South African regime. In May of 1980, the United Nations passed an arms embargo against South Africa, which cut off the supply of guns and military equipment to South Africa, and that in turn ended apartheid, helped end apartheid. And I'd always feel good. I'd always feel good that I played a part in that. I came back uh, after that and uh, quit the Foreign Service and after a few crises, I uh, met Ann Medlock and the story continued from there. After I left the Foreign Service, I, I was full of ideals, this time ideals of service, but I lost my nerve to go any further. I tried to get another job as a consultant. I didn't get a single client. So I was really desperate. But a friend comes to me and says, John, there's a tremendous money to be made in lecturing on cruise ships. Long story short, I applied for and got a job lecturing on a fancy cruise ship going from Vancouver, British Columbia, out here to Asia. It was good, and I took my then 13-year-old daughter, Mallory, with me, and we go off on this cruise ship. Three days off the coast of Alaska, this cruise ship catches fire. And Mallory and I are woken up in the middle of the night, and there's this disarming message saying, we're very sorry, but there's been a little fire, and we're going to clean it up. But as soon as we leave the stateroom, we see that the ship is full of smoke, so we start getting worried. We go up to the lounge. You can't go in the lounge because it's also full of smoke. Then we're told to go to the stern of the ship, and uh, a plane or a helicopter comes by with firefighting CO2 canisters, and firemen are trying to, looking very worried, running up and down the stairwells, and smoke is now coming up from the sides of the ship. And then there's an explosion, and the fire, which had never been put out, has eaten through all the glass windows in the ship's lounge and dining room, sucked in all the oxygen, and there's this mighty explosion. Now flames are leaping 30 feet into the sky. People are screaming, but you can't jump into the water because you would die in five minutes in that cold water. By some miracle, people get into the lifeboats, and there's no lives lost. And the lifeboats are, uh, are hit the water, but the problem is, is that a, a typhoon is coming on, Typhoon Vernon in those years, Typhoon Vernon. Typhoon was coming right at us. As soon as it was light enough, helicopters from shore bases, 140 miles away, began lifting people one by one out of the, uh, out of the lifeboats. Um, but it's a race against time because the helicopters work as fast as they can. It's only one by one. Uh, and the typhoon is coming on, which is going to kill us all. By 3 o'clock, the storm is so bad, the helicopters can't fly anymore. And the pilot leaves a message that says, uh, I can't come back. Uh, your only hope now is a Coast Guard cutter, cutter being a small rescue boat, uh, to find you in the storm. But by then, we're in the middle of this typhoon with 30-foot seas, which means the little boat's going up and down 60 feet. We're all deathly seasick. Rain is pelting on us. We're dying of the cold. Um, and things are looking pretty bleak. Uh, and once it's dark, they'll never find us. So it's a half an hour until dark. And really, it's a half an hour as to whether or not we'll live or die. And I'm not a very religious person. It wasn't then, and not really now. But let me tell you, when you're in a situation like that, um, one is led to prayer. I don't care what religion you have. One is led to do something. 
So I tried to pray to whatever it was that was up there. And, uh, and my prayer wasn't a prayer really at all. It was more like an angry complaint. <laughs> well, look, look at it. I mean, here, I've, I've, I've helped end apartheid, for God's sake, right? I've, I've left the foreign service. I've got, I now understand what my life is about. It's about service. It's about using my skills to make the world a better place. And it, isn't that what you wanted me to do? Uh, uh, and why are you wiping me out? I'm this young man with plenty of juice left, and I can do good in the world, and you're killing me? This is crazy. I want to know why. And I got an answer. And the answer was so much, in so many words, was stop kidding yourself, John. Stop kidding yourself. When you helped end apartheid, you found out for the first time what your life was about. It wasn't about adventure. It wasn't about power or rank in the foreign service. Your life was about helping other people. That was the lesson. Now you're throwing it away. If you get out of this, you'll lecture on another cruise ship. You have a decision to make. You have a decision to make about what your life is about. Well, I'm beaten. I know we only have a couple hours to live. I think my luck has run out. So I turn into the teeth of this storm, and I just say, yes. That's all I can say. And I know this sounds like a terrible movie, but the fact of the matter is, when I said yes, this Coast Guard boat comes crashing through this wild storm, <laughs> heading right for us. I mean, the visibility was only about 150 feet. The winds were blowing at, uh, at, at 65 knots. It was a miracle. And uh, we were lucky that the lifeboat wasn't cut in two. The rescue boat was so bang on to us. So obviously, I, we got rescued. I'm sitting, standing here tonight. Uh, you see, I think that that happened to me, that lifeboat experience happened to me I was devaluing my life by running away from what I then knew very clearly made my life meaningful. And this was a message to either keep doing that and die or stop running away. None of you are going to face death in the North Pacific. But I think there's a relevance, and that is that I think we all have challenges. Some of them really fierce challenges about the direction of our life, about to do or not do something that's of service, something that's meaningful. And if I learn nothing else from this episode, it's that you can't run away from it. And so I urge you, when these moments come to you, not in a sinking ship perhaps, but some other crisis in your life, at work, in your home, in your community, or in your family, when something like that is about to overwhelm you, don't run away from it. Don't run away from it like I did. Seize it. See what needs to be done. If nothing else, I'm convinced that each one of us has unique opportunities to serve, and that when you find those opportunities, those opportunities with your name on it, that that is what contributes meaning to your life, and it will change your life. <clears throat> There's an American poet named Mary Oliver. Uh, she wrote a poem called A Summer's Day, uh, and the line in it that rings most to me is, uh, she asks, tell me, what do you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? <laughs> what a question. Tell me, what do you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? A few years ago, um, I, I went to a high school reunion. I was bored to death with all my reunionees, all my fellows, fellow people in my class, because all they could talk about was their uh, second homes and uh, whether their lawn was green or not and uh, how much they were making in the stock market. Oh, give me a break. Except for one guy. His name was Tom. 
and, 50, and at the 50, 50 years before, he was the dumbest kid in class. We all made fun of him. But for the last 35 years, he'd been running, running a drug treatment program in our town of Tacoma, saving lives silently and powerfully. And when Tom talked about his work with addicts, he talked with a passion, and he talked with an excitement, and you could see that he had found the meaning for his life. He had answered Mary Oliver's question. He knew what he was doing with his life, and it was meaningful. So I want to leave you all with that one thought from the American poet. Ask yourself. Tell me. Tell me. What do you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Thanks. Stop. <laughs>